Okay, so once again, thanks for joining me. Um, we're going to be talking about supporting neurodiverse students in our classroom and all of the ways that we can think about meeting student needs. The good thing is that good teaching practices transfer. So when we have students that have particular needs because they're neurodiverse, we are often, if we're trying to meet their needs, we're often going to be catering to needs for other reasons too. If we have students that are uh, just undergoing a lot of stress, whether they have an anxiety disorder or not, we can meet their needs too. We have students that maybe have a death in the family, something like that. Uh, we can meet their needs. It doesn't necessarily have to be some sort of uh, neurodiversity or a long-term condition or uh, brain chemical situation. Sometimes these needs come and go, but we can meet them by thinking about these things um, and being strategic with how we're uh, presenting ourselves and, and, and uh, working with our students. Okay, so once again, I'm Dr. Lindsay Breland. Y'all can call me Lindsay. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm an inclusive teaching coordinator for CITL here at NIU. Um, I'll share out my contact information after this presentation, so it's easy to contact me if we have uh, any follow-up questions or concerns or anything. So in this workshop, we're hoping to leave with the ability to um, recognize that there's a broad range of neurodivergent conditions and they have various needs. Sometimes those needs do not um, don't overlap. Sometimes they do. Um, we can have two students that have the same diagnosis that need very opposite things. Sometimes they need more structure. Sometimes they need less structure. Uh, and so it can be hard to figure out what particular things uh, students like and need and makes their brains happy, but uh, hopefully we'll be primed to have those conversations a little bit more or to uh, empower students to tell us exactly what their needs are because a lot of times they actually know, actually, I need this thing. I need more scaffolding. I need more flexibility. Um, it would be helpful if we had a one-on-one -on -one conversation every two weeks to make sure that, um, that I know what's happening. Um, we're also going to develop strategies to support our students and foster positive learning experiences. Um, again, regardless of needs, if we're meeting the needs of some students, we're probably meeting the needs of a lot of other students too. And we're going to learn ways to create courses with accessibility built into them so neurodivergent can, students can advocate for themselves and are, feel like they're built into the class, not like they're not like there are exceptions to uh, what you're actively doing in class and what you're trying to achieve. So I wanna talk a little bit about neurodiversity. It seems like uh, y'all are at least a little bit familiar of, with it coming into this workshop, which is great, um, but I, I do want to acknowledge that neurodiversity is, is used to describe a variety of brain functions, behavioral traits, and mental health conditions. And these diagnoses and this understanding of what is neurodiverse is based off of this expectation of how brains and bodies are expected to respond to things. So there's a little bit of a... Um, What do we want to say? There, there's an expectation that you're going to behave in a specific way. And if you're not behaving in that way, then it's this other thing. And it's really, really complicated. Um, but I think that while it can be complicated about uh, diagnosing people um, as being neurodiverse or giving um, diagnosis as far as particular uh, quote unquote disorders, uh, or chemical imbalances or whatever, I think that it's helpful to recognize just that brains work differently, um, bodies work differently, and sometimes these things overlap with disabilities. 
um, but it's not necessarily a disability. Uh, you might get accommodations for those things. You might not. Um, sometimes it's very difficult to get a diagnosis. Sometimes it's very difficult to get uh, into doctors that take um, insurance that you have because uh, of the specializations. So there's a lot of barriers and complications that that go along with those things. And there's also, again, um, shame that can come along with it. Being uh, diagnosed with a particular thing can be um, can be shameful, can be sad. There's a lot of stereotypes that go along with those things. So uh, it can be a hard road in order to actually get a diagnosis, let alone accommodations, um, if it's relevant, quote unquote relevant, to get accommodations for um, your uh, neurodivergent uh, diagnosis. So it's very, very complicated. Uh, and it's very nuanced and it's incredible when students are willing to share these things with us. It's incredible when we're willing to share these things with each other because we can understand a little bit better that the way that uh, we're communicating, we're learning, we're thinking, we're behaving might not meet uh, the expectations of what we think a quote unquote standard student would do, uh, but that doesn't mean that these people are acting out. Um, it doesn't mean that they aren't listening. It's not mean. It doesn't mean that they're not trying. It means that we need to show some understanding and really think about the humanity in our students and in each other. Um, and I think that's one of the most uh, interesting things about about a lot of this accessibility. Uh, a lot of these accessibility conversations, excuse me, is because we have to realize that we are uh, teaching humans and then we need to meet them where they are, um, not expect them to uh, climb up to our level in order to uh, gain further understanding. So um, I mentioned, I think before I started the re recording that uh, there's a rise in numbers for neurodivergent people. So currently, um, it's believed that uh, 15 to 20% of people are neurodivergent. Uh, but more people are getting diagnosed. Um, and there is, especially uh, post-pandemic, um, well, I shouldn't say post-pandemic, post lockdown from the pandemic, more and more people are getting diagnosed and uh, they are self-diagnosing or they're getting actively uh, diagnosed by medical professionals. Um, and that's because there was this big break in routine and there was a lot of stress. And so a lot of people that were effectively masking and were able to slip into society and uh, not draw attention to themselves, uh, find ways to meet their own needs without asking for extra help or anything. Um, it was harder for them to do that. And so when cracks started to show in society, they became a lot uh, a lot bigger cracks for, for a lot of these people that uh, were neurodivergent. Um, we're becoming more aware of what behaviors are, are connected with neurodivergence. And we're also expecting more and more people to come to college. Um, and we're recognizing that the scaffolding and the systems that were in place in high school aren't there in college, right? We see so many students uh, they might come to class for the first two weeks, but then when they realize they don't have to, they disappear. And so we're seeing this over and over again. Um, we've been seeing it for years, but there's been just this higher rate going on. Um, but more and more students are expected to come to college. They're expected to get a, a BA in order to be professionals in, um, in the world outside of education. 
And we're finding that it's harder for them to do that, uh, that things are so, um, are so set in stone in the education system that it's really hard for somebody who has uh, flexibility to not come to class, who has uh, professors that don't have vested interest in their lives or them as individuals. It's really easy to just not show up, just not care, uh, just not feel motivated and not feel supported enough in order to ask for help or um, communicate their needs. So one of the things that I like to uh, talk about when we're thinking about neurodiversity, when we're thinking about neurodiversity in higher education or just in education in general, is this idea of what a good student is. So we think about students who are dedicated to learning, who are spending their free time doing their reading, who are doing uh, writing essays the night that it's uh, assigned, um, that stay up late studying and doing the things that, that they need to do in order to be uh, successful in their classes. Um, but some of those behaviors uh, correlate to neurodiversity. And we love those behaviors when it makes the students seem like they're good or they're dedicated. So if they're hyper fixating on something, if they have manic energy, they have insomnia or perfectionism or eagerness to please. We love that stuff. That's what we consider to be like a good student energy and good student behavior um, because we see them showing up and getting their work done. And demonstrating eagerness. But on the flip side, we uh, could have students that are are demonstrating manic energy, but then after that, uh, they need extra time. They're they're going through recovery after not sleeping well or have, after having um, that high strong energy for so long. And it's easy to dismiss students or to. Uh, to think that they're not showing up and not being serious if they need things to prioritize their well-being. So when they're not taking care of themselves, but they're focusing, focusing, excuse me, on their schoolwork, we love that. Um, we encourage students, whether intentionally or not, uh, to turn things in at 8 a.m. Um, with our with our deadlines, which means students are probably going to stay up all night doing the work. Uh, they're probably not going to wake up at 7 a.m. and finish that assignment, right? So we have to think about that when we're setting expectations for, for work. Um, we're encouraging them to pull all-nighters or normalizing all-nighters, but when they actually need sleep, when they actually need to uh, have regular meals, if they need to nurture their friendships, if they have to go to the doctor or to therapy instead of coming to class, uh, we have uh, policies that that usually penalize them for doing those things. Um, if they're a student athlete, if they uh, are involved in band or um, some sort of music thing on campus, or even if they do that for fun, if it's cutting into class time, if it means they're not getting their work done, they're usually being penalized for that. But we need to recognize that people have to have this work um, life balance and work for us isn't necessarily the only work that they're doing, right? They're usually going to be taking multiple classes, but also maybe working full time, maybe also caretaking. Um, and again, they have relationships to to attend to. They need to get sleep. They need to eat. Um, and if they're prioritizing those things over our classes, usually we're taking away points. Um, we're deducting letter grades for them turning in something late. We we have these expectations and whether we're uh, saying directly, hey, you should be skipping sleep or hey, you shouldn't go to the doctor, you should come to class. We're penalizing them with, with our policies and with our grading system.
So you all might be familiar um, with spoon theory and fork theory already, uh, but the, uh, the, I mean, they're popular, um, but I think that it's important to, uh, to talk about them. So spoon theory is uh, something that is applied to both disabled people and neurodivergent people. Um, so the idea, I, by the way, I don't know why they are utensils. I don't understand. Um, I don't know. I haven't looked into it that much that I understand. I, I understand the fork theory um, because it's uh, the phrase stick a fork in me, I'm done. Um, I don't understand where the spoons came from, but that's neither here nor there. Um, but spoon theory is something, this idea that you start the idea or you start the day with a finite amount of spoons. Um, and you might be able to add spoons in because you're doing restorative things, but people with illnesses and pain um, generally can't add extra spoons. So you have X amount of resources or X amount of energy units for the day. So if you are having a pain flare up or if you are having severe brain fog or something and you're not able to focus, you're able to focus on very specific things, um, for a very short amount of time, those things might require your spoons. So uh, you might have to have one spoon for showering because it is uh, physically or mentally draining to you. Um, if you are going to be cooking a meal, that might take a, a specific amount of spoons. Um, if you have to take care of your kids or take care of animals, that also might deplete your your uh, spoons. So essentially you have a, a specific amount of energy and uh, you can only accomplish X number of things within the day. This idea that we uh, we don't all have the same number of hours in a day, right? Um, if you have somebody else who is cooking for you, if you have somebody else who's cleaning for you, if you have somebody else who is uh, able to drive you around, then, then maybe you have more spoons to work with, but we uh, generally have a, a specific amount of energy and maybe you can get a little bit of energy back by a nap or something, um, but there's only so much you can do uh, with the energy that you have for the day. Um, fork theory specifically applies to neurodivergent people. And as I said, the, the fork theory comes from this idea of a stick of fork in me, I'm done. The idea that I can only handle X a number of, of challenges or stressors, and then I'm going to shut down or I'm going to melt down. So uh, it's not necessarily that this one last thing is so, so terrible. It's just that it's all adding up and, and we're finished for the day. Um, and when I say, shutting down or melting down. I don't mean melting down as like uh, throwing a tantrum or or anything like that. I just mean like not being able to really regulate your emotions and needing to escape a situation, needing to get to a place where you can be sort of alone or even just that. Um, so fork theory, something that, that might be a fork would be an itchy sweater. Um, my friend's mom uh, says this thing where uh, she's like, I can't talk to you right now because there's a tag in my shirt and it is scratching into my brain. Like this idea that something is, is off and she can't focus on anything else because of that sensory input and it's driving her like up a wall sort of thing. Um, so that's not uncommon for, for people who have uh, uh, neurodivergence that, that uh, includes issues with, with sensory input. Um, it might be a sound. Um, if somebody's fire alarm is, uh, or smoke detector, excuse me, is chirping, that might be one of the forks. It might be three forks for you. 
um, if you have a migraine, if you need to call about something um, and, and talk to people that you don't know or negotiate something that's kind of stressful, those might be forks. If you have too much caffeine, that might be a fork and your you uh, your body feels uncomfortable because of it. Maybe your body feels uncomfortable because you're hungry. So I think that um, sometimes it's hard to to understand where people are with their spoons and their forks. And so I'm not presenting these things as as measurements of uh of energy or mental capacity that you can really uh, check in with people and and ask like specifically how many spoons do you have left? Uh, but I am wanting to sort of like put this out there as a way to think about uh, energy is not endless. Um, and things that might seem small to you might really stack up for other people in different ways. And so we can't assume that students that, you know, they rolled out of bed and they're here at a 9 a.m. Uh, class and they've only been up for 30 minutes. We can't assume that they're coming into a uh, class at the same mental, in the same mental space as other people who have only been up for, for 30 minutes, right? They're, they have different things going on um, and their brains are, and bodies are responding differently to the inputs that they're receiving and the tasks that they're being asked to do. Okay. So when we have students who are neurodivergent and uh, who have disabilities that uh, correlate with uh, neurodivergence and can affect their uh, the way that they uh, are able to concentrate or think like um, for instance I have celiac disease and if I get uh, eat gluten accidentally um, get exposed to gluten it can give me brain fog so that's an experience where my brain doesn't want to um, doesn't want to do the things that it needs to do, doesn't want to focus, uh, but it's based off of a physical thing, not necessarily based off of like an actual um, ongoing chemical thing going on with my brain. Um, so if we have students that are coming in with these uh, differentiating needs and we're not sure if they have enough spoons or if they have too many forks when they're coming in the class, we can help them by just letting them know what's coming up. Um, we can make sure that we have assignments scaffolded so that if they're mentally checking out at some points, we still have this strong um, system in place where they're not going to be left behind. Uh, if we know what we're going to be doing that particular day, if we know what we're going to be doing that particular week, and we're sharing that with everybody, that's going to help every student, whether they're um, able to be mentally present or not, or physically present or not. If we create environments where students aren't being punished for mistakes, so if they um, mess up an assignment, they write a research paper instead of a persuasive paper, for example. Um, so that doesn't meet the, the expectations for this assignment. Okay, can we uh, go back to this what they have, can we make sure that we are uh, not scrapping everything that they've done? Can we get them points? Can we make sure that they can demonstrate that they can do the assignment or write persuasively and um, not make them feel bad about it or not uh, make them fail that particular part of the course? Um, and can we also make sure that we're showing up and responding to students that that need extra time or need extra um, things that we didn't plan for, and we're not treating them as being lazy or scamming or um, trying to use our kindness in ways that uh, that are icky. Um, if students are able to 
manage the workload for their courses and are, uh, understand um, where they've been, where they're going, they're more likely to be successful. And again, some of these things um, are really obviously helpful for neurodivergent students, but also students with disabilities, also students who have caretaking responsibilities, people that have other things going on um, or might be distracted, they're all going to benefit from this stuff. So I'm gonna talk about three major ways to support neurodiverse students. Um, I'm not gonna have a ton of time to go through everything, unfortunately. Um, so I will, uh, I'll share my slides with you all, but also, again, I'm happy to have um, conversations after this, uh, or if you want to ask particular questions at the at the end of the presentation, um, I'm happy to go in more depth about, you know, what your class policies might look like in order to support neurodivergent students if you're thinking about particular things that you are doing. Um, but just glancing at the time, I know that I'm going to have to skim through a few of these things. Okay, so thinking about assignments and assessments in particular, um, we want to make sure that we are creating opportunities to discuss your plans and your choices. Um, so as I mentioned early, what's uh, identify what the the schedule is. So uh, Obviously, there's a class schedule that you're probably going to be uh, giving to your students with what readings are going on, when assignments are going to be due, um, but also sharing what the day's tasks are uh, and sharing why you have particular deadlines. If students want extra time, but you're not able to give it to them, can you explain why? Is there a particular reason that your deadlines exist? Are are there deadlines that you have to meet specifically? I always have students at the end of the semester who, um, you know, sometimes they crawl out of the woodwork, but sometimes uh, they've had extensions and they wanna know if they can have extra time on top of those extensions. And if there's time for that, I, I allow it, but I also tell them there are specific hard deadlines that I have because, I have to be able to grade your stuff. This is the deadline that the university has for me submitting grades. I also am a person who needs to eat and sleep and take care of their dog and who has to grade other things too. So you can't turn something in two hours before the grades are due to the university because that doesn't give me time in order to be a human and do the things that I need to do to meet my needs in order to be um, well. <laughs> And uh, so, so I talk about that with students and I'm very direct with it. I don't create deadlines just for deadlines to exist. If there are things that need to be scaffolded, I explain to them, oh, you need to do this particular step in order to move on to this thing. So if we take a week longer to do your first step, then that means that your second step is a little bit off. Do we think we can do that? Do like, what does that look like? Can we get something together? Um, if you're supposed to have a first draft of, of your paper by this, this time, can you have at least an outline? So maybe you didn't meet all the expectations for this thing, but can you have enough so that we can move on? You're not gonna be behind. I can give you a grade on something, we can work together. Um, and I really explain things because it's so easy to be like, I said this thing, so it's this thing. Um, but students don't know it's important or know why you're doing the thing if you don't tell them. Um, so keep that, uh, keep that in mind. Um, I don't give any surprise assignments or presentations or quizzes. Um, that stresses me out as a student to have to take a pop quiz. I, I don't do that to students either. They're less likely to be successful. It takes a particular type of student in order to be successful for a surprise presentation. 
that's not necessarily something that you are teaching them how to do. Um, maybe in a speech class, you would be teaching them how to uh, take in information and quickly be able to talk about it for one minute. Um, and if that's something that you're focusing on, great, you can do that. Uh, but if we're trying to check learning and we're doing um, surprise quizzes or assignments along the way that have any sort of stakes, that's really going to stress students out. That's not necessarily going to work with their brains. And you are not going to be able to see if students are actively learning because the uh, the way that the assignment is is presented or the task is presented is going to be a barrier in itself. Um, and again, zooming out and zooming in. So uh, what are we doing to scaffold our assignments and to learn skills along the way to help with the larger end project if it all adds up to something? Um, but also reminding students why they're doing the work. So, okay, I know that it seems silly that you had to write uh, this outline, but you have a five page paper due at the end of the semester. So if we do this one step, we are closer to that end of semester thing. If they, uh, if you ask them to write one paragraph and, um, and a thesis statement, and that's hard for them, uh, they might want to write a different paragraph. They might be able to do something, um, that is quote unquote less logical to the way that you think about uh, writing or the way that you think about drafting process. Um, but they might be able to complete some work and have something to show you and not be dissuaded from completing things because they're doing it in a way that maybe isn't the, the exact way that you're expecting them to do it. Um, and then of course, if, if your class is leading to a larger certification or acceptance into a next class, if it's leading to uh, them taking the bar exam or something, then making sure that they're aware like, hey, I'm doing this because it links to this thing and this is your overall goal. So we're working towards this. I'm not just asking you to do busy work or trying to make you feel silly or less than. Um, because there's a power structure with our classes and a lot of times neurodivergent students have been made to feel um, silly or less than or um, unintelligent because they haven't been able to do work the way that they were expected to. Um, and that's really, really complicated and, and sad. Um, we want to make sure that we're creating opportunities for additional support too. So uh, if we're able to create study groups or reading groups or writing groups for your students, that's great. Maybe you have that, depending on how big your classes are, maybe you have a writing group that meets um, in the library. You, you uh, reserve a, a room in the library and everybody meets up for an hour on Fridays. Um, and you're available during that time, but it gives them an opportunity to write or ask questions in a more relaxed situation. Uh, you can encourage them or offer upper offer, excuse me, opportunities for them to body double or parallel work. Uh, I've had students who um, want to body double with me. Um, I should explain that. So body doubling is essentially doing work at the same time in the same space, but not necessarily interacting. So having another person to uh, set the expectation of like, this is a work room, this is a workspace. Um, and so uh, to some degree that happens in, in particular spaces in the library where it might be a quiet space and people are just working on their things, but um, I've done this before with students who want to come to my office. Um, I will have a little section of my desk for them, and we just work on our computers for an hour. If they have questions, they can ask questions, but it also creates this environment where there's some sort of accountability, so we're not going to be messing on our phones or um, being disruptive, but it also feels uh, uh, friendly 
And so I think, and, and there's encouragement in, in doing that together. And I think that that uh, helps with them feeling comfortable uh, doing their work and feeling like there's less pressure for them to write that paper or do the thing that they need to do. Giving options for your students is, is huge. Um, if they're able to incorporate their interests into whatever they're doing, if they're able to write a research paper and they can choose a topic, great. Um, but also if they can choose the medium. So maybe they aren't going to write an essay, but maybe they do um, a PSA video instead on the topic. Um, or uh, do an interview podcast. Maybe they uh, are, are thinking about application of skills in interesting or different ways that aren't quote unquote traditional in education. So uh, we can still teach skills like writing skills, but have students apply them to mediums that are going to show up more in their day-to-day -day life or possibly in their careers beyond college. And it might feel more comfortable. I've had a lot of students choose to do things that um, take more time sometimes. Like they'll choose to create videos and they actually have to edit them and they have to worry about uh, about the, the sound and captioning and all of these things that well, for me, it would take more time. I guess maybe for them, it doesn't take as much time as maybe writing an essay, but it become it's something that's more natural for them. It's something that they uh, enjoy doing more. So they still had to write the outline. They still have to demonstrate that they have an understanding of the skills um, in order to do the thing. They're going to write a reflection about it afterwards. Um, so if they're going to enjoy it more and they're more likely to get it done and uh, it, it's just happier for their brain, that's fine with me. Um, we want also want to make sure that we're introducing and normalizing tools, tech, apps, and methods to accomplish goals. So uh, some of us might be already familiar with like the read aloud functions that we have on the office programs. Um, one of the resources that I uh, really recommend is Natural Reader, and you can use this application for eBooks, PDFs, and other documents. There's a free and a paid version. Um, I had a faculty member that I talked to, I think it was last spring, um, and she was saying that her students really needed, you know, a tool. It was hard for them to actually physically look at the page and read so much, um, especially with an ebook. And she followed up with me after I told her about the natural reader. And she said that a lot of her students actually ended up paying for natural reader because the paid version was so worth it for them because they could actively do things with their hands or move around um, and, and take in the information. And it was just really, really, worth it for them to pay, um, but it was working really, really well for their brains. So some of our students might have a hard time sitting down and reading. We can offer other options to them. Um, there's also organizational apps that they can be that they can use, and some of them are for free. So uh, through our office uh, 365 suite, we have tasks available, which is just like to-do lists, and it can send you reminders that you have particular things due on particular days. Um, highly recommend that. A lot of our students don't really know how to use all of the Office 65, 365, excuse me, stuff. So sharing with them links so that they know that this the stuff exists or demonstrating um, to them, this is how I use this thing, can be really helpful. Um, showing them office calendar or um, the office outlook calendar or a google calendar and showing them how they can create um, events and set up reminders for those um, then there's also a, a variety of of apps like evernote to doist bear goblin tools and brain focus that can help specifically 
uh, people with ADHD and people that need more scaffolding need to break things up into smaller chunks. Um, students also don't know how to uh, label uh, folders and documents and create a clear system how to retrieve information. Um, I'm sure you all are familiar with students submitting something that's like doc 12 and you're just like, how did you even know this was for my class? You submitted something that has no description in it. Um, and so if you can show them how to create folders and how to organize things in folders, it's really helpful. They just never had anybody teach them how to do that. Um, so maybe that's a, creating a silly little video that you upload on, on Blackboard. Maybe that's not actually taking time out of class to do it, but students don't know how to do these things. And sometimes it just doesn't even occur to them to do it if someone doesn't say directly, hey, are you are you creating folders? Are you labeling your documents? Um, where are all those readings existing when you're downloading them onto your computer? Are they just in the downloads? Do you actually know what what that is, what class that's associated with? Um, and also using lists. Uh, I use a lot of different lists in my life. I have notepads in every room of my house, including in the bathroom. Um, especially like when I get out of the shower or like when I'm getting around for the day, I think of things and I have to jot it down. Um, and it's really useful to show students that they can do uh, to do that. And then it also keeps them off of their phones. I like taking notes on my phones too, or on my phone too, but sometimes you get distracted because you see a social media um, notification or uh, you think about TikTok or whatever. So showing them that they can take notes in a particular way um, or, you know, uh, re write reminder notes in a particular way and that this is useful. Um, this can be happy for your brain to have uh, post-it notes and have little notes on them and then you get to throw it away once you do it. Um, maybe not the best thing for the environment, but my brain really likes it. So uh, I talk to students about stuff like that too. Um, as a way to have a to-do list that you can actually look at, but also uh, you can see what you're accomplishing. Um, ideally, we want to make sure that we're demonstrating kindness and care, and we're giving students opportunities to make mistakes and grow. Are we giving them opportunities to redo assignments if they're missing points or if they missed the point altogether? Are we making sure that they have extensions on deadlines if they're going to not sleep that night? Can we give them an extra 12 hours to make sure they get some sleep before they turn something in? Class policies and management. Um, I really believe in, I'm going to be giving a presentation about this um, later this month too, but I really believe in creating policies that focus on community and engagement, not compliance. So we don't want to be um, punishing students for not meeting our expectations, especially if those expectations aren't actively working against um, what's being accomplished in the class. So if students need to move, there are particular places in the room that might be better for moving and we can get them into those places. Okay, if you need to leave regularly, um, to use the bathroom or something with, with particular students with disabilities, we can tell them where to sit so they can access the, the door to come and go. So um, students that might have to get up and move their body, if they need to fidget, we can direct them into specific spaces in the classroom so that they aren't bumping into other people, that they're not walking in front of them as as conversations are happening. Um, but we can also make sure that they're getting the things that they need. Um, students will um, might eat or drink in class because they uh, completely forgot to do it elsewhere. Um, that's really helpful to make sure that they are meeting their needs and are able to show up into class and not be uh, frustrated or overwhelmed because of those things. Um, if you have students that fidget a lot, I recommend having uh, pipe cleaners 
a cheap way and a and a, a way that doesn't uh, draw a lot of attention to the fidgeting because there's no sound, but students can play with them and it gives them something to physically do without uh, distracting other people with something that has like um, a louder noise like uh, a, a popper or even I have a, a fidget ring and it's got a little bit of a noise that you can hear. So pipe cleaners are great. It encourages them to move their hands as they need to without uh, causing a lot of distractions. Um, students uh, are often told to, uh, to mask and to fit in. And sometimes it's hard because they get so excited about something that's not super related to class. And um, we don't want them to talk forever. So acknowledging that they're excited about something, th thanking them for that, and giving them an opportunity to talk to you further after class um, and saying that you're excited to learn more about that thing or you want to really have that conversation, but we have to move on because we only have X amount of minutes left. Um, that's a great way to, to acknowledge that um, and not shut them down, but also still accomplish what you need to accomplish in the day. Um, we also need to make sure that we're letting students be themselves. Um, if we are finding students to be disruptive, um, is it because they're actively trying to be disruptive or is that because we're interpreting their behavior as being something that is disruptive or rude? Can we talk to them about like, hey, when you're doing this, it's uh, really distracting. When you're um, playing with your, uh, with the top of the desk next to you um, and, and slamming it down, it's probably something that's like a sensory input. Uh, but that's really distracting to other people. What can we do instead? How can I um, make sure that uh, you're feeling comfortable, but also other people are feeling comfortable? Um, most of the time, students don't want to be distractions. They don't want to be mean. They don't want to be rude. Um, they're just trying to exist. And so meeting them where they are is, is going to be very helpful. Okay, I'm running out of time. Unfortunately, um, but I will just briefly um, say about communication. We want to make sure that we are uh, allowing students to connect with us in varying ways. Um, we want to make sure that we are meeting um, students where they are again and talking them through tasks, identifying what's going to be done, what need, what they should have done, how can we get from this place to this place. Um, Students are, uh, if they're if they're indicating their needs, and you feel like something that they're asking for is too much, um, think about how far you can go into that direction. Because I don't think you're going to regret kindness, and I don't think you're going to regret um, an opportunity to connect with a person that um, needs your help and and wants to be successful in your class. Okay. So I want to give you all an opportunity to uh, share your experiences or ask questions. Uh, we don't have many minutes left, and I'm so sorry about that. Um, but are there, are, do you have particular questions, or are there some ways that you've supported neurodiverse students or some needs that they've asked you to support uh, that you would like to share with us? Uh, thank you, Lindsay, so much for um, taking the time to present and share this information with us. I think it's really helpful and it's given me a lot of additional ideas. Uh, I'll just chime in and say I've had a lot of experience um, and success with uh, providing students with like fidget toys and different manipulables. Um, and this goes to, this is true at the college level as well as at the middle school and the high school level. Um, sometimes all it takes is, you know, giving them something to, to let some of that energy out. Um, I've also seen an awful lot of uh, high school teachers who have non-traditional or alternative seating, um, including like exercise balls and different types of things like that, which, you know, within reason and with clear expectations have been 
set it to have been really successful. So uh, yeah, I just want to say thank you again. This has been really helpful. Thank you so much, Maria. I think that's a great point to the seating. Um, not all of us are going to have like a ton of options with that, with the environments that we're teaching in. Um, but if we're asking them to do, you know, 15 minutes of um, reflective writing, hey, do y'all want to sit on the floor? Do you want to move around? Do you want to do this? Do you want to do that? Do you want to listen to music for those 15 minutes? And giving them a little bit more um, control over their bodies and the situations that they're in um, can be really, really helpful. And yeah, college students, um, as much as uh, younger students have sometimes this energy that they need to get out. We um, we know about the, the people that bounce their legs and about the people that click their pens. And uh, we, we've been in the room with those people and sometimes it's uh, frustrating, but they have this energy and they have this fixation um, and the sensory input is really, really important to them. So if we can do something to help them get those needs met that uh, makes them feel good, isn't distracting to others, that's great. Which is, you know, again, why I recommend like the pipe cleaners, um, but also if we have classes that are that are kind of long, or if we feel like everybody's got a little bit of that zoomy energy, we can go take a lap around the building. We can um, move our bodies. We can get our wiggles out. Even if we're talking with a, a group of 30 year olds, we can still get our wiggles out. We can still move um, in and out of the room. We can still do stretches. We can do we can still do things that um allow us to move our bodies and to physically release what we need to release before we go on to try and learn a little bit more. Okay, Sarita, um, I've implemented only hard deadlines around the end of the semester. Yes, um, it's it gets a little bit hairy at the end of the semester for sure. And that's when we need to make sure that um, things are getting met because like you said, there's uh, limited access to things. Um, it's also very challenging with teaching movement to those who have different abilities of learning new movement. Yes. Um, I have established a Teams folder to put videos of rehearsal so they can review it on their own time. I love that. That's so great. I think that, um, and again, it's helpful for students that aren't able to physically make it into class too, to be able to see those things and have reference, uh, to be able to reference those those materials and, and see that movement on their own time too. That's amazing. Okay, it's three. So I wanna make sure that I'm respecting your time, um, but I just wanna say thank you so much for, uh, for joining me. Um, I'm gonna be sending out, again, the slideshow. I'll send out the resources that I uh, looked at and I'll send out my final thoughts um, along with that email in a little bit. Thanks so much for joining me. I really appreciate you both being here. Um, and as questions and concerns and things pop up, let me know. I'm so happy to do one-on-one -on -one conversations or answer quick uh, emails, send resources, think about how these things apply to the uh, fields that you are teaching in individually.